From Chicago, Illinois, the Voice of Prophecy presents live The Midnight Cry with Kenneth Cox, an adventure in understanding where we are in the light of Bible prophecy. Tonight, we're talking about the coming of Jesus Christ, fire in the sky, about the coming of Jesus, how is he going to come back? What does the scripture say about it? What is the manner of the coming of Jesus Christ? That's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, this is important, friends, because what you and I need to understand is what the Word of God says. And the Bible offers us some counsel that we need to be very careful about this subject, that we do understand what the Bible says about the way in which Jesus is coming. So tonight's subject is a very important one, and we hope that we'll be a blessing to you in a special way. One of the marvelous promises is, is that you and I will be able to behold him, to see him. And I want you to listen tonight as Isa Spania sings, We Shall Behold Him. The sky shall The shout of his coming, the sleepy shall rise from their slumbering place, and those who. 
Gracious Father, we look forward to that day when we shall behold you. We pray tonight that as we look at the ways in which your word has revealed that you're coming, that you'll give to each one of us insight. Pray, Lord, that our hearts may be open. The Holy Spirit may have access to our minds and that it will lead and guide us into the truths of your word. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. The scripture describes the coming of Jesus Christ with these words. Found here in Matthew, the 24th chapter, in verse 27, it says, For as lightning comes from the east, and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Scripture just simply says, as lightning comes from the east and flashes clear across the sky to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. As a boy of nine years of age, uh, my parents moved from Chicago here to Oklahoma. Moved out on the farm, and for a nine-year-old boy, who had lived right down town, Chicago, that was a radical change. And my father was very, very fond of hunting and fishing. And so we hadn't lived in Oklahoma very long until one day he said to me, he said, uh, when you come home from school, if you'll get every, all the fishing gear ready, I'll have your mother fix us uh, lunch and all, and when I get home from work, we'll go out and we'll spend the night on the river fishing. Well, of course, that was wonderful to a nine-year-old boy, and so I got everything all ready, and my father came home, and we put all the fishing gear in the car and drove out to the river to spend the night on the river. And uh, I can remember we went down and stuck our fishing poles in the ground there and put out our line and the hook and the sinker and everything and uh, got ready to try to catch some fish. And uh, my father went up on the top of the bank there and uh, we have some trees in Oklahoma that are called post oaks. I don't know if you know what they are. 
but uh, they're not a very tall tree. And my father took a hatchet and cut down some of these post hoke runners. And with that, he built a little lean-to and he spread a blanket out under this lean-to so that if we got tired or we wanted to go up and take a nap, we could. And so I went down on the bank and was fishing and uh, we weren't, fish weren't biting very much. And so I got bored and I went up and sat down on the blanket and thought I'd take a nap and hadn't been there too long until off in the distance I could see the flash of lightning. Didn't think about it, much about it. But as the time passed, I could begin to hear the thunder and uh, didn't worry too much about it. But as time passed, the flash of lightning became stronger and the sound of thunder became louder. And uh, as it got closer to us, well, I guess my father got concerned about me and he came up there where I was and sat down beside me. Uh, this storm, folks, passed right over where we are. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever lived in Oklahoma, but Oklahoma is Tornado Alley. You know, they really get storms come through there. I, to this day, have never forgot that storm. I have never seen it lightning like it did or the sound of thunder. I mean, the thunder was so loud that it would shake the ground. And the, flat, the flash of lightning was so bright, folks, that I could shut my eyes and I could still see it, you know? Well, let me tell you something. When it says, as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth clear to the west, you better believe you can see that. There is no question about it when it talks about the coming of Jesus Christ that it will be something that you and I can see without any question of a doubt. In fact, the Scripture tells us that the coming of Jesus will be very glorious. Titus, the second chapter, verse 3, looking for the blessed hope and what? Glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. How glorious. How glorious is the coming of Jesus going to be? Talks about the glorious appearing as lightning shines from the east even unto the west so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, the Scripture tells you exactly how glorious the coming of Christ is going to be. Luke, the ninth chapter, verse 26, it says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed. When he comes in his own glory, okay, there's one that says that Jesus is coming in his own glory, and in his fathers, that means in his father's glory, and of the holy angels. So it says he's going to come back in his own glory. He's going to come back in the glory of his father. He's going to come back in the glory of the angels. Have you ever looked at that to see what that's like when it says he's coming back in his own glory and in the glory of the father and the glory of the holy angels? Well, you remember an incident in the Bible that illustrates what the glory of the Father is like, Moses. Moses has gone up on top of Mount Sinai. And while he's up there on top of the mountain, he says to the Lord, he says, I'd like to see your face. And the Lord said, Moses, no one has seen my face and lived. But I'll tell you what, I'll put you over here in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over it. And after I've passed by, I'll let you see my back. And God put Moses in the hollow of that rock. And it says that when God passed by, Moses saw compassion and love and mercy and all the wonderful attributes of God. After that was over, Moses is coming down out of the mount, has the Ten Commandments with him. Watch what happens here. Exodus 34, 20. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, listen, folks, behold, the skin of his face, what? Shone. And they were afraid to come to him. I mean, just the reflected glory of God was so bright that the children of Israel couldn't stand to look at him. They said, Moses, put a veil over your face. We can't stand to look at you. That's the reflected glory glory of God. What must it be like when Jesus comes in the glory of his Father? 
Not only says that, it says he's going to come back in his own glory. Christ's own glory. You remember? He's taken Peter and James and John with him up on top of, Mount, of the Mount Transfiguration. And while he's up there, all of a sudden he's transfigured and Moses and Elijah appears to him. And this is what it says happened. Matthew 17, verse 2. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the... What? Like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. I mean, this is the glory of Christ. All of a sudden he was transfigured and his glory shone forth and his face shone like the sun. Clothing was as white as light. And then it also says... He's going to come back in the glory of the angels. You ever considered that? The glory of the angels? What that must be like? You remember at the resurrection? The Bible says that one angel came to the tomb of Christ. And when that angel came, I want you to see as it pictures what took place there. Matthew 28, 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel Lord descended from heaven. <laughs> One angel, and there was a great earthquake, all right? And came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Now listen. His countenance was like lightning. That angel's countenance was like lightning. His clothing is white as snow. One angel came, sat down. His countenance was like lightning. Now, folks, they've stationed a centurion. That's a soldier that has a hundred soldiers under him to guard the tomb of Christ. What did these soldiers do? And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. One angel. His countenance was like lightning. Now, what's it going to be? What's it going to be like when the Scripture says that when Jesus comes, that all the angels are going to come with him? How many angels are there? Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Do you know what 10,000 times 10,000 is? That is a hundred million. Ten thousand times ten thousand. You see, the Scripture never numbers angels. It says a hundred million and thousands of thousands. It'll say the innumerable company. But all these angels are going to come with him, and every one of them's countenance is like lightning. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and... What? All the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. So when it says the appearing of Jesus Christ is glorious, you better believe it's glorious like man has never seen. I can tell you tonight, dear friend, don't let, any, let anybody ever tell you that you won't see it. Let the, don't let them tell you that you won't know what's going on. I can tell you when he comes, everybody will know something's going on because it will be a glorious appearing. What does the Bible tell us about the coming of Christ? Well, it tells us several things. One, it tells you, be careful what you hear. Be careful what you hear about the coming of Jesus Christ. This is the counsel that Jesus himself gave about his coming. Matthew 24, 23. And if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there... Do not believe it. Somebody says, oh, Christ is over here. And I hear that today every once in a while. Somebody will say that. Don't believe it. Listen, he continues on. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. That somebody goes out here in the middle of the desert and they perform signs and wonders and they say Christ is here. What do you do? You don't believe it. See, dear friends, you can't take 
signs, and miracles as a sign. You cannot depend on that. You can't build your faith and believe on signs and miracles. You can only build your faith and believe on the Word of God. You can't build it any other place. Don't try. If you do, you're going to be on false ground, friends. It won't hold you up. You've got to build your belief on the Word of God. Listen as he continues. To deceive, if possible, even the elect. It says, if possible, they'll deceive even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, run out there. Do not go out there. Don't go. Or look, he is in the inner room. Do not believe it. The Bible is clear when it comes to the coming of Jesus Christ. It's going to be something, friend, that you won't have any trouble seeing. It's not going to take place quietly. It's not going to take place secretly. You're not going to wake up and say, where did everybody go? That won't happen. Everybody will see and understand that Jesus is coming. It won't be quietly. It will be seen by all the living. Everybody will see it. You won't have any trouble seeing it. Hebrews 8, 28, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, listen, he will appear the second time apart from sin for salvation. It says that he will appear. You're going to see him. How, how will I know it's Christ? Well, the Bible gives you a perfectly clear example of what the coming of Jesus Christ will be like. Because when his disciples were with him, he took, him out there, took them out there on the Mount of Olives, and as they stood there, Jesus Christ was taken into heaven. Watch, because it tells you exactly how the coming of Jesus Christ will be. Acts 1, verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So it says that as they were standing there, all of a sudden Jesus began to ascend into heaven and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, continue. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Now listen, here's his coming. This same, who? This same Jesus. Now, I want to ask you something. Did they see him go into heaven? Oh, yes, they stood there and watched him. This very same Jesus that had spent three and a half years with them, working with them and teaching them, that same Jesus they had watched heal the sick, that same Jesus they had seen speak to the people, that same Jesus that had blessed the little children, that same Jesus, listen, who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Does it tell you how he's coming back? Absolutely. As the disciples saw him go into heaven, so he will come back just exactly like he went into heaven. They saw him. You and I will see him. No question. Behold, Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. Yes, they see him. Every eye will see him. Every living soul will see him. And it says the wicked will literally mourn. So it's not something that's going to be done out in the desert. It's not going to be off in some hiding place. It's going to be something that everybody will see. No question about it. With the coming of Jesus is great, great destructive force. 
I mean, the world will be very much aware. Now, folks, it speaks, and I'm going to read you some texts about what happens when Jesus comes. Revelation 16, 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his, into his, bo his bow unto the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. This is the end. This is when Jesus is coming. And there, and there were noises and thunders and lightning, and there was a great earthquake. That always amuses me a little bit. I live in California, and you know what they talk about in California? They talk about the big one. When is the big one going to hit? Well, I can tell them when the big one's going to hit. When Jesus comes, that's going to be the big one, I can assure you, all right? Because it says, there was a great earthquake. Such a mighty and great earthquake has not occurred since men were on the earth. That's the big one, you understand? Okay. And, uh, and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Okay. So this is the destructive force that's there at the coming of Jesus Christ. But dear friend, let me tell you something. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be concerned. Because Psalms 91 says, A thousand may fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with your eyes shall you see and behold the reward of the wicked. No plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. See, my safety is in Jesus Christ. Sure, there's going to be great destructive force, the coming of Jesus Christ. It says there will be hail that will fall that will weigh 57 pounds. That's what the Scripture says, that hail will fall. An earthquake, it talks about all the destructive force that will be there, but God's people will be perfectly safe in the hands of Jesus Christ. The coming of Jesus Christ won't be silent. Not going to be something that uh, be whispered or talked about. It's going to be loud. Psalms 53, our God shall come and shall not keep silent. Our God shall come, not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. So it says that God's coming. It's going to be loud. He's not going to keep silent. And listen, it says that God is going to be there, that he has a controversy with the nations. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25, 30. Therefore prophesy against them all these words and say to them, the Lord will roar from on high. I mean, this is talking about the coming of Jesus. And utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his foe. He will give a shout. And by the way, that shout is tremendous. That shout is so loud that it will roll through this earth like peals of thunder. What will happen? As those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth, a noise will come to the ends of the earth, and the Lord, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. So this is not silent, folks. When Jesus comes, it'll be something that every individual will hear. They'll not only hear it, they're going to see it. This is what will happen as Jesus comes back. He will plead his case with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. You see, when he comes and he shouts and his words just roll through this earth like peals of thunder, something happens. Did you know what happens? That shout is absolutely so loud that the dead in the ground hear it. That's what it says. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a, what? Shout with the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They're going to hear it. They're going to come out of their graves. So you can put it down. 
The coming of Jesus is very glorious. Secondly, it's something that everybody's going to see. And thirdly, it's something that everybody will be able to hear. Won't be quiet. Not at all. Then us, those who are here, you see, dear friends, you may be alive at the coming of Jesus Christ. And if you are, like I said, he will protect you. He'll care for you. And he says that all those people that are alive, that are followers of Jesus, they're going to be caught up with the dead that have heard the voice and have come forth in the graves to meet the Lord up in the air. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So it says that they're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is a promise that God gives to every one of you here tonight. I don't care who you are. It's a promise that Jesus made. And let me tell you something. The throne of God, the throne of God is staked on the fulfillment of his word. Therefore, if God promised it, you better believe it'll happen. Okay? This is the promise that God gives to each one of you tonight. John 14, verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. If what? If it wasn't so, he would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and what? Receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he says, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to gather all of you, and I'm going to take you to be with me, my Father's house. I'm going to take all of you there. Oh, dear friend, what a wonderful promise, marvelous promise that God says, I'll take you to be with me where you can enjoy all the wonderful things that God has prepared for those that love him. So the coming of Jesus is a promise that God gives to you and to me, and it says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So it says that when Jesus went to heaven, it says that a cloud received him out of their sight. It says when he comes back that he's coming back on a what? Cloud. A number of years ago, you may have remembered there was a great lot to do about UFOs. Do you remember that? And uh, I really got interested in UFOs. And I don't know how many books I read about UFOs. But you know what I found out? There's a religion connected with that. You see, they believe that Jesus went to heaven on a UFO. And they believe he's coming back on a UFO. And, and there's a whole religion tied with that idea of a UFO, that he's gone, went to heaven, coming back, and so forth. Do you know what those clouds are? When it says that a cloud received him out of their sight. Do you know what they are? Listen. Psalms 104, verse 3. And he lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariots. Hmm. It says that God makes the clouds his chariots. Listen carefully because the Bible will tell you exactly what's involved here. Who, speaking of God who walks on the wings of the wind. The chariots of God, okay, the clouds are his chariots. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands of angels. That's what they are. The Lord is among them in Sinai in his holy place. So when it talks about those clouds, that they're God's chariots, that's referring to the angels. And it says that all the angels are going to come back with him, and he will send his angels with the great sound 
of the trumpet. Did you know that every one of you here tonight have an angel? Whether you like it or whether you don't, you got one. And that angel goes with you throughout your entire life. The Bible tells you, in fact, the Bible tells you, you need to be very, very careful how you treat children because the Bible says that that child's angel looks on the face of God. That's what it says. Do you remember the time when Peter had been put in prison? And because Herod had cut off the head of James and that had brought him so much favor, he decided that he would behead Peter also. So he's had Peter put in prison. The next day, Peter's going to lose his head. Do you know what Peter's doing? Uh, what would you be doing? Praying? Yeah. Peter's sleeping. That's what he's doing. He's sleeping. And while he's sleeping, God sends an angel. You know, angels have a key to every prison. Did you know that? They have a key to every prison. And they can just walk through the doors. In fact, they had put Peter in solitary confinement. And there was about four steel doors. And then they had chained him between two guards. And the angel walked right into the room. The chains fell off Peter's arms. And the angel said to him, Peter, get up. And Peter thinks he's having a dream. That's what Peter thinks is going on, see. And the angel finally had to say, Peter, get up. And Peter finally got up, and he's still thinking he's dreaming. And finally the angel said, Peter, put on your shoes. And Peter puts on his shoes. And they, the angel takes him and they walk out of the prison. The gates, the doors just open without any trouble. And they get outside in the street and all of a sudden the angel's gone. And Peter realizes he's not dreaming. All of a sudden the reality comes that this, the angel has taken him out of prison. And so he goes to the home of John Mark. You know what they're having? They're having a prayer meeting for Peter because they know he's to lose his head the next day. So they're all there praying for him. And Peter knocks on the door. And a young girl by the name of Rhoda goes to the door to see who's there. And she looks out the hole, and there's Peter. And she gets so excited that she doesn't let Peter in. She runs back and tells the people. She says, Peter's at the door. Peter's at the door. And they said, no, Peter's not at the door. Is that the way your prayer meetings are? Hmm? Said, no, no. Peter's not at the door. And she said, yes, Peter's at the door. And they said, Rhoda, are you okay? Are you all right? And she said, no, no, Peter's at the door. And they said, it's his angel. You see, each one of us have an angel. And when Jesus comes, folks, it's going to be that angel that's going to get you. I don't know whether you will be coming out of the grave or if you are alive when Jesus comes, but it's going to be that angel that's going to come and get you and take you and present you to Christ. An angel that knows more about you than anybody else because that angel's been with you throughout your entire life. They're going to come, gather all of God's people from all over the earth, and they're going to take you and present you to Jesus. Marvelous what he'll do for each of us. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So he's going to gather all of his people and bring them to meet Jesus. But let me tell you something. There's no second chance. No second chance, friends. I'm sorry. Not some other time. It's now. Now is the day of salvation, not some other time. Listen to the words of God. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is your time. You're not going to have another life, not another chance. You have this life, and this is your opportunity to give your heart to Jesus Christ to accept him. It won't happen again. Only this life is all that you have. Revelation 22, 11, 
He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Dear friends, there's no second chance there. Are you understanding? When it comes, it says that person that is righteous, he'll be righteous still. That person who's filthy, he's going to be filthy still. There will not be another opportunity. And it says, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his works. No second chance. I had an uncle. He always said, well, when I get old, I'll accept Jesus. Well, he got old and never did. You see, now's the time. Not going to be another opportunity. Jeremiah 8, 20 says that some people are going to say the summer, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Just think. Uh, it really concerns me that people here in the United States that have had such a marvelous opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have been favored beyond words, and yet how many of us have become gospel-hardened? Say, oh, I've heard that before. Some other time, I'll think about it. The Bible says that many of them are going to say, oh, the harvest is past, the summer's ended. We're not saved. Dear friend, I hope tonight that you won't put it off. Don't say another time. At a more convenient season? No. This is the time when you and I need to accept the Lord. As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. A great preacher of the past by the name of Charles Finney studied to be an, a lawyer, an attorney. He had gone away to school. He had been raised in a Christian home, godly mother, and uh, as he got away in school, he just pretty much forgot God, forgot his Christian upbringing. And in his senior year in law school, one day he was sitting at his desk studying when a voice spoke to him and said, Charles Finney, when you finish school, what are you going to do? Oh, he said, I'm going to practice law. And the voice said, uh, what then? Oh, he said, uh, when I feel financially secure, I'll probably get married. And the voice said, uh, what then? Oh, he said, uh, have a family. Raise, raise my children, have a family. And the voice said, uh, what then? Oh, he said, I hope that I'll make a contribution to my community and to mankind and the people that are living around me. And the voice said, uh, what then? And he said, well... I guess I'll, I'll retire. And the voice said, uh, what then? He said, well, I guess I'll die. And the voice said, what then? And all of a sudden, with absolute clarity, that scripture came to his mind. And it is appointed to men to die once. But after this, the judgment and Charles Finney got on his knees and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. I would like to ask you tonight, what then? When it's all over, what then? What are you going to do? Are you going to give your heart to Jesus Christ? Accept him, open up your life? Because, dear friend, this is the only time you have. You don't have another time. But take heed to yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing in drunkenness. The scripture says, watch out, be careful, 
lest all the cares of this life grab your attention and you're so busy doing maybe good things that you miss eternal life and the cares of this life that the day come upon you unexpectedly. Oh, dear friends, you and I can't afford to let that happen. We have to be watching, waiting, prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. So God is inviting you tonight to accept him. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to accept all these things that will come to pass. He said, be careful and to stand before the Son of Man. That's what God's asking you and I to do to be prepared. A friend of mine was over in the Middle East. He was in the country of Jordan, had spent several days there in the country of Jordan, and he had, it had come time for him to go back home. And so he decided that he would go out to the airport early in the morning and would make all the arrangements and would, I don't know how many of you have traveled, but many times it takes quite a long time to go through customs and this type of thing. So he made arrangements for the hotel that he was staying in to take him out to the airport. And that morning, the airport was running a black Cadillac uh, from the airport to the, uh, from the hotel to the airport. And so my friend got in the black Cadillac and it took him out to the airport. Uh, when he got to the airport, he took his luggage and all and checked in at customs and went through customs. And then he decided that he was just going to find a place off in the corner somewhere and sit down and do some reading and writing. And, uh, but as they drove up to the airport, he noticed that there was police everywhere. I mean, the whole place was full of police. And so after he had gone through customs, he walked outside the airport and he asked one of the policemen, why so much security? And they said, oh, haven't you heard King Hussein's coming in? He said, he's, he's due to land any time. And my friend thought, ah, this is an ideal time for me to get some pictures. And so he got his camera out and... Uh, went over and found a place where he thought he could get a good shot. And he said it wasn't too long till he could hear the drone of the engine of the plane and it began to circle the airport. And it said it came down and landed, taxied up to the airport there, stopped. And then he said the people scurried around and they rolled out a red carpet all the way out to the airplane. And then dignitaries came and lined up on both sides of the red carpet and he said after a little bit, the door of the plane opened and a guard stepped out, looked everything over very carefully. Then the guard stepped back into the plane and King Hussein came out, went down the stairway, and then as they do over in the Middle East, he began to embrace each of the dignitaries along the red carpet. And my friend was shooting pictures of all this as it was going on, and he said they walked through there. And he said he just happened to turn and look and there outside the airport, right in front of the airport, were lined up black Cadillacs waiting to pick up King Hussein and take him to the palace. And he said all of a sudden he had a bright idea because he said setting off over there side was this black Cadillac that had brought him to the airport. So he said he got up and he went over to the driver of that black Cadillac and he asked him how much it would cost him to get him to pull in right behind those other black Cadillacs and follow King Hussein back into town. And the fellow told him, and so he just pulled out the money and paid him and got in the black Cadillac. And he said, pretty soon King Hussein came out and got in the first one, and the other people got in the other one and all. And he said they headed for town. And he said on the way to town, he said there were people all along the highway there standing, waiting to see the king. And he said they were shouting and waving, and he said it was so wonderful. He said he sat back there in his black Cadillac and waved at everybody and said everybody waved at him. He said it was so nice to be part of the king's party, to belong to the king's party. And he said when they got into town, he said the sidewalks were four breasts, and he said they were throwing confetti, and they were waving and shouting, and he said he just sat back there, waved at everybody, 
said it was nice to be part of the king's party. Said they got down the street a little ways and they turned and he said way up ahead he could see the palace. And he said as they got closer he could see the gates. And he said as they got closer he could see guards standing on each side of the gate. And he said as they got closer he saw that first Cadillac pull up there and stop and he saw those guards bend over and look at every person in the car and wave them on through. And he said he reached up and tapped the driver on the shoulder, said, pull over, this is as far as we can go. (laughs) Are you going along for the ride tonight? Is that all it is to you? Are you part of the king's party? Are you a child of the king? Or are you going to have to say, this is as far as we can go. Tonight, God is inviting you, each one of you, to become a child of the King, to be prepared for the coming of Jesus because He is coming soon. In these the closing days of time, what joy this glorious hope affords and soon a wondrous truth divine he shall reign king of kings and lord you please take that white card that you received when you came in this evening? The three questions I want you to look at with me this evening. The first question says, I believe Jesus is coming back. I believe that with all my heart. I believe Jesus is coming back. I hope you do. I can tell you right now, there's enough evidence out there that you ought to believe it. If you believe that Jesus is coming back, put a check by number one. Second question, I want to accept Christ as my Savior. Dear friend, let me tell you something. The only way I know to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ is to give Him your heart, to accept Him as your personal Savior. And tonight, if you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, I'd like to invite you to accept Him. If you know that when Jesus came, you would be lost. If you know that tonight, then won't you just in faith reach out and accept him this evening and give him your heart? Put a check by number two. And the third question says, I'd like to follow Jesus into baptism. If you'd like to be baptized, then put a check by number three. You see, baptism, folks, if you don't understand what baptism is, baptism is a public declaration of your acceptance of Christ. That's what it's about. When you accept Jesus Christ, baptism is a public declaration of the acceptance of Jesus Christ. It means that all your sins have been forgiven. They've been washed away, giving you a clean slate to start over with. And so if you'd like to be baptized, put a check by number three. Put your name, your address on it, fill it out as Maddie sings. He's coming soon. He's coming. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
thankful that he's coming back. And Lord, from all indications, it's soon. We pray that each one of us here tonight may place our faith in you, that we may hang on tightly to your word, and that we each might follow as you lead us. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.